Cassatt seems to have made the decision that she wanted to be an artist when she was just 15 and a year later, in 1860, she enrolled in the illustrious Pennsylvania Academy for Fine Arts, America's first art school and museum. It was only over the previous century in Europe that women had even begun to be allowed to become members of art academies, and by no means all. And in certain respects, the Pennsylvanian Academy was an enlightened institution which offered its numerous female students the same education that its male ones received, drawing from casts and copying old masters, as well as working with models. Cassatt, though, was disparaging, complaining that she spent too much time drawing animals, cows, she claimed. In addition, although her basic training was adequate, women students still faced a local art world whose museums, dealers and collectors expected women to be society portraitists at best. In 1865, with the American Civil War still raging, Cassatt made the inevitable decision to come to Europe to study more seriously as an artist. And so, even though her father was very much against it, together with her mother, she set sail on what effectively was an artistic grand tour. And her first stop was here in Paris. Now, she later said that Paris was the kind of place that a woman could do serious work and be recognised for it, although it's worth reminding ourselves that an artist supposedly as radical as Renoir was soon to say that women lawyers and professors were like five-legged calves, but that women artists were merely ridiculous. Now, the place she should have come to was this, the École des Beaux-Arts, the most illustrious art school in Paris, and therefore one of the great art schools of the world. But, of course, it was men only. So instead, she approached one of the newly appointed professors, a man called Jean-Léon Jérôme, and became his pupil on a one-to-one -one basis in his studio. But her real place of learning was just a few hundred metres down the way over the river. Here, in the greatest museum in the world, the Louvre, Cassatt joined the ranks of eager young artists who scurried around with sketchbooks or set up their easels in order to study the phenomenal collections there. But the Louvre was just one illustrious part of the Parisian art world. The place where reputations were made or broken was the annual state-supported Salon, a showcase for contemporary art which increasingly formed an international centre for artists, dealers and collectors. Cassatt exhibited this picture, the mandolin player, at the Salon in 1868. It's a touching, slightly sentimental, but direct image of a peasant girl making music. And it seems to have been deemed above average by the jury, who hung it at eye line on the walls, which were otherwise filled from floor to ceiling. Fired up by her modest success, Cassatt submitted once again a year later, but was rejected and told her friends she felt humiliated. After a brief visit to Rome with her mother, the Franco-Prussian War forced Cassatt back home in 1870. After a few months back in America, of course, Cassatt wants to travel back to Europe, where things have calmed down, but her parents are very reluctant to let her go, so much so that they won't give her funding. However, she decides to find her own means of funding the trip, so she goes to Pittsburgh, where she has a meeting with the Catholic bishop there, and he commissions her to make some copies for the cathedral in Pittsburgh of work by an Italian Mannerist master called Correggio. And these works are in the Italian city of Parma, and with this commission, that's where she goes, the beginnings of another big extensive trip around Europe. And she spends about eight months in the city and she makes these copies, she earns her money, and then she starts to explore the art of the Italian 17th and 18th century, which starts to inform her own paintings, of which this is perhaps the best example. Now it's quite interesting because there's a dilemma even in her family, about her painting. They wanted to be a portrait painter. That's more respectable. She wants to paint broader, bigger pictures. And in this work, she uses a portrait format to produce an image called the Bacante, which has classical undertones. And it's a picture of a woman who's one of the followers of Bacchus, the god of wine and frenzy and celebration. And these women make noises. They cut animals up, they party, they drink. And it's as if she's working her way through aspects of European art history, with a little nod to Caravaggio, who painted Bacchanalian subjects and began, really, this marked contrast of light and dark in European painting. There's also something of the experimentalist here, though, in early Cassatt, because she has this rather brutal crop on the arm, which, if you look close to it, you can see it was intended. You can see where the painting ends and the canvas, or the, the primed canvas, begins. But what you, I think, get from this painting most strongly is not just an artist who's searching for her own style, but in a rather quiet, subtle way, she's trying to make her own noise. 
Cassatt returned to Paris, renting a studio at 19 Rue de Laval, and began to move away from the European old masters towards the radical young masters of her own day. The story goes that Cassatt was wandering up the boulevard houseman looking at the art in the gallery windows when her eye was caught by a series of vivid, fluid pastels. It changed my life, she later wrote. I saw art then as I wanted to see it. Because this was the work of Edgar Degas, one of the leading lights in the first radical movement in modern art known as Impressionism. Impressionism had come to public prominence in 1874, when a painting by Claude Monet called Impression Sunrise had been ridiculed by French critics. Their subject matter was modern life, train stations, streets, people at play, and their techniques were experimental, trying to capture the fleeting sensations of light. Equally crucial for Cassatt was the fact that they'd been regularly rejected from the salons, so much so that they'd set up their own exhibitions. Cassatt's desire to be involved in the Impressionist movement is growingly evident in this painting, called prosaically but accurately, Little Girl in a Blue Armchair. When you look at it, first of all, you're struck by the increasing bravura and looseness of the brush strokes, particularly those that define the armchair. And there's something quite brave about Cassatt's decision to paint the little girl with a tartan rug and a cushion behind her against this rather busy backdrop. But it gives the surface a real sense of animation. However, Rather than just have the compressed and slightly claustrophobic structure or format that Cassatt's favoured to this point in her career, she opens up the space so the chairs take our eyes on a kind of cyclical motion around the surface of the canvas. And the background, she was helped by Dega, not least in the grey areas here, but also in painting the light that streams through the windows in the back. Perhaps Cassatt let him do so because she needed to be part of the Impressionist milieu, but it also shows a generosity of spirit that you might not always find in male artists with big egos. But actually, all the energy and sophistication comes from Cassatt. The crucial point, though, of this painting is its mood and its subject matter. There's a lovely, gentle humour in the painting, not least with the dog, which is a Belgian griffon. And Cassatt had these dogs ever since she discovered them in 1873 in Brussels. They remained with her throughout her life. But there's something slightly comical about the dog whose eye just seems to be opening as it sits on the armchair next to the little girl. And in a way, there's a kind of pictorial rhythm there. It's a balance in a painting that is otherwise asymmetrical. She's off centre. But of course, the key figure is the girl. Now, there's no such thing as an accident in painting. The crucial point is, why or how we choose to interpret what the painter gives us. If this were by a male artist, that pose with the girl fully frontal, legs slightly apart, would be seen as very provocative. With Cassatt, I'm not so sure though. I think she's looking at something rather different. Look at the pose of the child, slumped in this armchair. She's comfortable, you can see that from the background, she's comfortable in every sense. She's a bourgeois kid. But that's the key point, I think. Rather than as in a lot of paintings of children, showing them as slightly sentimentalised or cutesy, or as little ladies on the verge of becoming adults. What Cassatt is focusing on is entirely natural. It's that slightly languid boredom that kids have. And in a way, it makes the image more universal. Cassatt was now in her early 30s, childless, and partly forced to be a child again when her parents and sister arrived in Paris, effectively forcing her to give up her studio alone and live with the family. But the family was also to inspire her art, featuring in her scenes of daily life from the period, such as this picture, Reading Le Figaro, which is a portrait of her mother, Catherine. It's a contemporary image of an intellectually astute and well-informed woman, rather than the more traditional images of motherhood. Stylistically, the work is looser and lighter in touch, a symphony of different shades of white, and it clearly shows Cassatt moving increasingly towards Impressionism. So much so that a year later, in 1879, Cassatt cemented her creative relationship with the group by accepting their invitation to show at the fourth annual Impressionist exhibition, held on the first floor of number 28, Avenue de l'Opera. One of the works that Cassatt showed in the fourth Impressionist exhibition was this one, woman with a pearl necklace in a loge or box at the theatre. In fact, it's her sister Lydia. And what we have is a view of contemporary Paris. More than a million people every month went to the theatre in the city. So Cassatt is painting modern life, as the Impressionists were doing. But also, 
she's doing some other things. Look at the figure of the woman, illuminated by the top left-hand corner in a halo of artificial light that casts challenging shadows on the woman's face and her body. She's also wearing this pretty pink frock that both reveals her body and disguises it. And the painting in some ways is about what we see and also what we don't see. The woman is looking at a show and we're looking at her. She's observing a spectacle, but she is the spectacle as well. It's also a work that is painted with visceral expressionistic brush strokes. We see Cassatt pushing at the technique of painting. But it has this other spatial twist, which is the mirror in the background. Because we're aware of the theatre and what is happening because of this mirror. What Cassatt is doing is taking a device that other Impressionists, Renoir, Degas, have used as a means of making more space in the painting. It's a way of extending the sense of space. But she does something rather subtle. Rather than have it parallel with the picture plane, where you would see her reflection almost directly behind her, and actually by implication the painter or the spectator would wonder why they were not in the picture, she angles the mirror. So we can see the reflection here on the left of the painting. And by doing that, she starts to make us much more aware of this whole idea of representation, that painting is on one level a mirror of the world, and in this case, a mirror of modern Parisian life, evening life, night life. But at the same time, she makes us aware of its artificiality too. Now the critical response to this work was very good. People wrote of the exquisite symphonies of colour that you saw in Cassatt's work. But she did receive some harsher criticism, an American, ironically, who said that it looked like a woman far gone with jaundice wrestling with her fan in a box at the theatre, and that it was part of a movement or a new school that he had no comprehension of. Now, in a way, that's good for Cassatt, because she's blooded with the other Impressionists, who had also been savagely criticised. But perhaps most important to her, her father's response. Reluctant to begin with, if you remember, but he says she's now known to the art world. Also, two other characteristics emerge. The first is, she starts to work in series or to explore the subject matter from a number of different viewpoints. In fact, the subject matter of in the loge or in the theatre box is something that she picks up after this. Secondly, she starts to experiment technically much more with the process of painting and of mark making. The end of Impressionism proved to be no hindrance to Cassatt, who embarked on perhaps the most fruitful period of her career as she began to experiment with the process of printmaking. She seems to have been initially inspired by a vast exhibition at the Beaux-Arts in Paris of 725 Japanese woodcut prints by Utamaro, Horishiga and others. You must not miss that, she writes to her friend Bert Morisot, the painter. I dream of it and I don't think of anything else but colour on copper. Still restricted domestically by her ailing parents, Cassatt began an ongoing series of domestic life, of women bathing, combing their hair, of tea parties, conversations, letter writing and motherhood. Some have said these are uneventful images, the daily routines of an upper class woman, but they tell a gentle story from a perspective rarely seen in the history of art, that of a woman artist, and technically they show considerable invention and complexity with Cassatt fusing the two traditional methods of aquatint and dry point etching. In turn, the prints also fueled Cassatt's paintings, not least an extraordinary mural that she produced for the World Fair held in Chicago in 1893, when she was asked to paint a 12 by 58 foot epic depicting modern woman. Cassatt's mural, sadly no longer in existence, has been described as the most important work by a woman artist in the 19th century. It sought to show how women had risen from their original condition of servitude. At the centre of Cassatt's panel was the subject of a young woman plucking the fruit of knowledge and science, a subversion of Eve in the Garden of Eden, an area that Cassatt also dealt with in her prints. It was a highly ambitious project at a time when the few women artists who had any profile were still encouraged to stick to pastels, portraits and miniatures. Not surprisingly, perhaps, the work was savagely criticised by the male cultural establishment but its example inspired numerous women over the next few decades. Having completed a mural to the modern woman, Cassatt then went on holiday to the south of France, to Antibes, where she produced a series of works of which this is far and away the most striking. 
It's called The Boating Party and pays distant but direct homage to a work produced by Manet that was shown at the 1879 Salon and that Cassatt subsequently helped be acquired by an American collector and she described it as the last word in painting. Nonetheless, she decides to try and produce a postscript which in a way is an evolution of Manet's art and of Impressionism more broadly. That flickering quality where sunlight dances on water is still evident in Cassatt's work, but details are pared down and what we have is this bold, striking composition. In order to paint this, Cassatt, who was notoriously a sufferer of seasickness, staged everything on the shore. She went out to sea to make sketches of the effects of water, but was so chronically ill that she hired the boat, put it on the sand, so the sea was in the background and would frame the heads and the silhouettes of the figures. And then she hired three models. Even though this looks like a family, they just hired models or the man here wearing the costume of a Provencal fisherman. And having staged the scene, what she produces is an extraordinary taut and sophisticated formal composition. The composition is quite strongly cropped with the horizon line and just an inch or so of sky visible at the top. And you get this amazing sense of horizontal layering through the boat to the sea, to the shore, to the sky. But the real tension here is in the foreground where it's as if, as you stand in front of this work, you're actually in the boat itself. It's an intimate painting that draws you into the scene. Then, almost rebuffing the viewer, is the man who pulls away from the woman in the painting and out towards the viewer. But to give that kind of tautness, Cassatt then has the sail being pulled in the other way. So you get this push and pull motion. And all the lines from the arabesque curves of the boat to the oar to the man's hand point inwards and that's amplified by the way the light casts this almost arrow-like form on the child's face. And this whole central area becomes compelling. There's a tension between the figures as they look at each other. And people have speculated on whether or not this was the father, or meant to be the father, or whether it was just a hired boatman. But ultimately, I think, what's really important about the painting is that Cassatt has this controlled, sophisticated and bold vision. And the work announces the fact that she's reached some kind of artistic maturity. Cassatt's father had died in 1891, and although she was devastated, his death did give her a newfound sense of freedom, and for the first time in her life, she was able to buy her own house. Here, the beautiful chateau of Beaufren, where she'd stayed summers previously, and she'd put models in boats on the little lake, and started to paint around the mill, and increasingly she became enchanted with both the gardens and the house in what became a large studio in the outdoors. But inevitably for Cassatt, there were limitations on her freedom, not least her ailing mother. Nonetheless, she was able to move with some degree of ease between the hustle and bustle of Paris, 90 kilometres away, and this tranquil country retreat. If it was the death of her father that had initiated a newfound sense of freedom for Cassatt, the death of her mother in 1895 triggered her last great creative phase. Perhaps in homage to her own mother, Cassatt explored more intently than ever the subject of mother and child. It's one of the most prominent themes in art history, usually a depiction of the Virgin Mary and her infant son. But Cassatt paints tender, caring images of modern mothers, feeding, bathing and reading to their children. In a way, they're yearnful pictures. Cassatt never had any children of her own and proclaimed on more than one occasion that she was married to her art. Soon after, with the outbreak of World War I, Cassatt was forced to head south to Grasse, but she soon came back here to Beaufren. And for the last 10 years of her life, she had a studio and a print room here in the mill. But sadly, she spent more time taking joy in the garden because her eyesight was failing and she had chronic cataracts. And then, on the 14th of June, 1926, at the ripe old age of 83, Mary Cassatt died a highly successful artist financially in her lifetime, but one who in her later years thought perhaps she may have sold out too much to the market. It's quite easy to overstate the case with Cassatt. She was, after all, a fringe member, if an accomplished one, of the most radical art movement of the last 200 years, Impressionism. But now, 80 years or so after her death, with the dust settling, I think two things emerge. One, She's a very important, early, great American artist, helping to build up a cultural momentum whose impact is still evident today. And secondly, and perhaps most crucially, even though she hated to be called or labelled a woman artist, 
She's a pioneering woman figure, one of a handful of women artists before the 20th century whose reputations were strong. And now, at the beginning of a new century, when women are at least the equal, if not perhaps stronger than men, as a kind of force in the visual arts, the example of Mary Cassatt seems highly significant.